Hey y'all, it's Steve, Hobo with Wood, and in this video we're going to talk about docking in Lightburn. So docking, what is docking? When do you use it? When can you use it? And how do you use it? But if you are designing a lot of uh, your own work using Lightburn, there are times when you need to move parts in a particular way, position them in a certain area, and you might be struggling with ways to do it. You've come up with creative ways to make it happen. But there's a tool in Nightburn that has become one of my favorite tools as of late, as I'm doing more and more designing of my own creations. Docking is an extremely useful tool, and there's a lot of things you can do with it. And we're going to explore as much of it as possible, as quickly as possible. But this is going to be a pretty in-depth uh, dive on docking. So... Let's jump into Lightburn and figure out what the dock's up. So you may not have docking turned on. So docking, turning it on. What? Where? When? Alright, so if you go to your window menu up here in the top of your Lightburn toolbar, you have all your drop-down menus that, and, and toolbar menus that are available, and right here is docking. If you turn that on, if you check it, your toolbar will open up the docking menu. Add it to your arrange menu. Now, it may be positioned here, or in, if you haven't had it open before, it may be positioned down here. But what you're looking for are these four pictures, move as a group, lock inner objects, and padding. Now, if it sh shows up somewhere on your menu or your uh, arrange bar you don't want, if you look for those, that vertical line of gray dots and you hover over those, once you do, you see the cursor turns to a directional arrow, then you can just left click and drag that and move it anywhere you want it to be. Now, I like mine up here, just at the end of my toolbar. That's where we're going to park it. Now, as you see, there are four pictures here. Move as a group, lock inner objects, and padding. Let's talk about the pictures first. The pictures show a large skinny rectangle and a square with different arrows and movement around it. And if you look close enough, the smaller square has three little squiggly lines on one side of it. Well, those lines are representation of movement. So the first pair shows that smaller square moving leftward against the taller, skinnier rectangle. The second one shows it moving right. That one shows moving up. And then the last one shows it moving down. And if you hover over each one, you will get the actual menu description there, dock objects leftward, and so on. Dock objects rightward, upward, and downward. But if at a glance you can see those squiggly lines, very barely see those squiggly lines, but those are the representation of movement and it looks like there's an arrow showing it being moved to the left. So how does this work? Well first we'll start with a single object because it's important that you understand what's happening when when it's happening. Now that it's selected, if I just tell it to dock leftward, dock objects leftward, it's going to move that square to the extreme left of the work bed. Now, there is nothing else in the way of that square moving so it's going to move until it comes into contact with it still selected I'm going to tell it move rightward so it moves to the extreme right side of the work bed upward downward 
But the difference between docking and moving to the corner, so that moved it to the upper left corner. If I undo that, we can achieve the same thing by telling it to dock to the left and then dock up. And it went to the left corner. But that's not what docking is for. Docking is for docking against other objects. And because there are no other objects on this work bed, that's where it's going to. It's going to the far edge of the work bed. But if we introduce another object in between the square and the edge of the work bed, when we select just that square now and we tell it to dock to the left, it's going to move until it comes into contact with that circle and stop. But having two objects on the work bed is not enough uh, in, and of, in and of itself for docking to work because if these were positioned in a manner that they're, when this one is selected, this is on a higher plane or higher up on the work page than this circle. So when it's selected and told to dock leftward, it's going to do just that. It's going to move right past that circle until it comes into contact with the edge of the work bed. Okay, so now let's look at docking and working with different shapes and the difference with working inside other shapes versus docking. Here we have a square, a rectangle within another uh, square rectangle. And it, if I select that and tell it to dock leftward, what happens? It goes to the edge of the work bed because it does not recognize the internal being inside of it. It's this, it's not seeing this as an object because it's an incomplete line. It's all it's seeing is this line and not an object, I guess. So it's going to go to the next solid object, which in this case, is the actual edge of the work bed. Now from here, since we're outside that square, if we tell it to dock rightward, it will go right to the edge of that square. So you can't use docking when you're inside of it. That's when you would actually take and hold your shift key, select your second object and then tell it to align to the left side. And that's how you would dock it there. Not docking, but parking it or aligning it to the edge of that internal piece of the square there. So there are times when you need to use your alignment tools and times when you need to use your docking tools. Now when I'm working and I'm designing freehand, creating a, a new object, I find myself often as I create uh, different uh, parts of my designs where I will be building them independently and then when I want to make them you know align together there are ways that you can do that uh, if, in fact if we zoom in here and I wanted to align this to this well if you come right over to there and find that corner of that rectangle and you can right, left click your mouse and drag it until you get another target right there and that's telling you so if I drop it down see that that targets going away but if I take it back up to that target well now that's docked against the square, against the side of that perfectly. But if I don't want to be that precise or worrying about trying to control it, it is easy enough and even quicker if these are out here and it's up there. I can just tell it to dock left and then shift and a line and there it's parked where I need it to be uh, so there are there's no one way to do things this is just another way to get something accomplished uh, there's no right way no wrong way I found much more uh, convoluted extensive ways to accomplish this until I found docking so you can get here a hundred ways and none of them are wrong if you reach the conclusion that you're looking for. This is just one more feather to put in your cap or one more arrow to put in your quiver. Okay, now let's talk about when we're wanting to dock multiple objects and 
all the different scenarios, not all, but several different scenarios of what happens when working with multiple objects. So we've got this one square and we need to dock, for whatever reason, these three objects up against the side of this square. But we want to keep these in the same orientation as they are. Their same spatial relationship needs to maintain. Well, as it stands, if we just grab those, select all of them, and tell it to dock leftward to that square. Well, that did not happen the way we wanted it to happen. And the reason for that is because we didn't tell it to move as a group. So if we undo that, and we come up here to the top of the menu bar there and turn on move as a group. Now when we tell it to dock leftward, it maintains that orientation. And once the first contact in that group happens with the square, then the other pieces stop moving as well. Now, if we were to have a situation where for some reason this was positioned here we tell it to move as a group still and we tell it to dock leftward what's going to happen everything moved until something come into contact with that square which was this second object because this one had no way to come into contact, so it continued moving until some contact took place, and then that's when it stopped maintaining that same orientation, that relationship with each other, but it moved until it touched the square. We undo that, we turn off move as a group, and we tell it to move leftward. Now, the hexagon just went shot over to the edge of the work bed and these two both moved together. We've lost all of that orientation. Everything's changed. Most likely not a desired outcome you were looking for. So that's how you would use move as a group. Now the difference between move as a group and lock inner objects can be a little bit confusing sometimes because it almost acts like they're one and the same, but they're not. They're entirely different. And the way you can remember the difference is moving as a group is regarding when it's objects that are layered. So I've in this demonstration, I've put all of these objects inside of this circle on different layers so that you can see how these work differently. So right now, if we look at that, you can see I've got three different objects inside of a circle and each of them are on their own layer over here and if I select all that and tell it to move as a group to the left it does just that undo unlock that and move to the left now you can see all of the pieces moved until it contacted so ungroup that turn lock inner objects on and move to the left. Well, that looks like that's the exact same thing as move as a group. But here's where it's different. These, uh, uh, the, the lock inner objects are for, is for when you have inner objects that are on the same layer. And it's a little bit confusing, but it's easier to demonstrate with text than it is anything. So let's look at text and I've got some horizontal spacing in there. Let's get rid of that. All right. So now our horizontal spacing, vertical spacing is all set at zero and I'm actually going to use test instead of text because curved fonts always throw another wrinkle in the mix. So let's make this as difficult as possible and let's put another one down here. Test so these are identical using the same size fonts and the same spacing 
But say there was something about this that I needed to edit for some reason, and it required me to convert this to a path, and then I wanted to go in here and change something about this particular shape. Let's say I wanted to uh, give that a radius for some reason. Can I do that with radius tool? Is it too, too tall here, 0.01? Is that going to let me? There we go. Yep. And so that was the only thing I needed to do. I just rounded that off. I don't know why, but that's just what needed to be done. And in order to do that, I had to convert it to a path. Well, I want you to see what happens now. So let's take this test, which is just the regular text that has not been converted. And I'm going to tell it to, in fact, let's, let's move all of these away, further away. And now I'm going to select this one that's been unaltered, tell it to dock left, and you see what happens. Now, in fact, let's, uh, let's undo that, turn off lock inner objects. So now move as a group is off, lock inner objects is off. This is just regular text, and we're going to move it dock left. So we didn't need those. But now if we take this one, now this has been converted to a path, nothing's turned on, we tell it to dock left, what's going to happen? I know. Do you? So now we've got a different result because those are a path and not a text. Each individual piece moved until it come into contact with another piece. So if you see the inner part of the E, it even moved until it come into contact with the T. So let's undo that and now lock inner objects and tell it to dock left. Now see the E stayed intact. We locked those inner objects. The E did not get distorted but all of the letters continued to move until they bunched up against each other. Now some of you out there who have been using fonts say, well, I can accomplish the same thing, same thing by changing the spacing between the... No, you don't. Because if you look, there's no overlapping of these letters. And this is why I wanted to use the letter S. See, it come into contact with the E down here. It's not touching up here. So there's, But as soon as it made contact, it stopped moving. But if you come down here to the regular text, and we start changing uh, the spacing. Let's see, right here, I believe. Yeah. And you start squeezing those together. Well, if you look, we get on down. All right. As soon as they make contact, now they start to merge. Now the S and the T have merged, but nothing else has come into contact with each other yet. And if you continue to reduce that spacing until you've got contact with the E and the S, see how close the T's gotten? We still don't have any contact over here because it's able to slide underneath that capital T. And before you ever get any contact like that with the T and the E, now you can't even read it any longer. So there are different reasons you would want to do this. In fact, at this point, let's see, I'm curious if we select this. Now, I don't know what's going to happen here, but with that path selected, those have been bunched up together. And if we tell it now to weld all selected shapes, uh, yeah. So there where there's that, it was had a line, it actually welded those together. Here it's a single point of contact, so there's no closure there. And same thing here. This arc comes around until there's a single point of contact, so there's no true welding taking place there like you have down here. So that's the difference between locking inner objects and move as a group. Whenever you have several shapes, like this word test, and it is on the same layer, the same cut layer. 
you can lock those inner objects and keep that E intact. And that move as a group and lock inner objects, those are gonna be a little tougher for you to grasp and play with and fully understand because I've got a, that much understanding of it. But there's one more thing to look at and that's the padding. So let's clear the work bed and look at padding. So the last feature in docking is padding. And padding, I'm sure, is going to have its time and place to be something that would be used. It's a little bit, uh, I don't know how to say, it's backward thinking. It's not as intuitive. There we go. It's not as intuitive as I would like to see when using padding. But you can make it do things. You can get it to, you can achieve certain outcomes if you jump through certain hoops. But um, let's show you what padding does. Let's say we've got a bunch of random objects here. Um, I'm just going to draw out a bunch of different squares, different sizes, different orientations. Nothing in particular. <clears throat> but now I'm going to select them all and just for easy on the eyes, put them all on the same lower plane there. Now, if I want to have all of these, and I'm moving them to the right so I can move them to the left, so you can see the grid nice and easy, even rather. If I want to have a one inch padding, and this padding value up here is going to work just like most of the other numeric fields. Right now I'm in inches. If I change that to millimeters, you can see there it just changed the padding to 25.4, which is one mil one inch rather. But working in inches, if I use a one inch padding, I've got all of these selected and I tell it to dock left. It's going, because I have no other objects on here, it's going to dock it to the edge of the work bed. Now if I was to put a circle on here or any other object, it's going to dock it to that circle. But right now I'm wanting to use the grids uh, so you can see the spacing and how this works. So we're going to dock it to the edge of the work bed. Selecting all of it, we've got a one inch padding. Tell it to dock left. And you can see, because I have my grid right now set up on half inch increments, there's a one inch padding between the edge of the work bed and that first square. Now you'll notice it doesn't have a one inch padding here, here. It looks like it might be there, but it's hard to tell because uh, I'm not exactly on the grid, but I believe that's a one inch spacing there. But let me show you, uh, don't think that is. But if you now if you take all of these that and go back to the right and bring it back to the left, that's a one inch space. This is not. Right, left again. That, there we go. Right, left again. And lastly, one more time. Now, those are all one inch spacings. Now, if I were to take and for, for those doubting Thomases, We'll make this a one inch square, perfect one inch square. Go away, unlock, done. All right, now, <clears throat> I'm just gonna duplicate this one, two, three, four, five times and move it off. I'm on. Didn't wanna get all of them. And that should be the last one. Oh, all right. So those are one inch squares and now you'll be able to see the grid and know for sure, yes, is exactly one inch. But grab them all, I'm gonna shift and dock them to the left. There you see that's one inch, but none of these are. 
because they're too close. Now let me show you what happens if we start out with a space that's greater than an inch to begin with. And actually what we're going to do, I'm going to change this to a half inch so I've got plenty of room to work with. We'll take that greater than a half inch, take that greater than a half inch, just moving all these further apart than a half inch, and I'm going to change my padding space to a half inch padding. Now select all these and move them left, and it should actually do it all in one movement. And there you go. Half inch, half inch, half inch, half inch, half inch, half inch. So as long as they're spaced further apart than your desired padding, it will move them all at one uniform movement. But if there's less than the desired padding, you'll have to move them and then move them back, move them in, move them back, move them in until you got them all where you wanted them. So that's where it's not quite as intuitive as I'd like for it to be. I'd like it for it to be, regardless what that sp initial spacing is, if I tell it I want a half inch padding and tell it to dock, then move it in the necessary way to where it slides it to that initial half inch padding and then spaces each individual one accordingly. But it won't do that. It's not that intuitive yet. Maybe in the future, but not now. Now, the other issue is if you have... Uh, and, and these are uh, probably things that you can also do in the array when uh, much easier when you're working with shapes like this that are of the exact same size. You would use the array tool. But where this comes in handy is when you've got various shapes and sizes, but you want that specific padding. You're not going to be able to achieve that with the array. Um, if you were to have control, let's duplicate all this and move these up and over and I'm going to put these intentionally kind of close and now I'm going to put all of these on one plane there we go all right and let's do a quarter inch padding select everything move it over here and I'm only moving it left or moving it over here because this gives you a full half inch on the grid so it's easy to determine yes the spacing is what you think it should be so now I've got all this selected and I'm gonna move it dock it all to the left at a quarter inch padding and it looks like uh, for the most part those are all quarter inch on the bottom and yeah quarter inch looks all padding there but we don't have it does not affect this spacing between those two levels because it's only looking at the padding as it moved left the padding is only uh, affecting the direction it's moving in all right so now if you wanted to make this padding a half inch you would just come in now and select this one, move it up and away, dock it upwards, and now bring it back. And there you have your quarter inch spacing, just like the array would have put it. And like I said, this really would come in handy whenever you're playing with different sizes and or different shapes. I'm using the same uniform shape here just so that you, it's easy to, for you to see and that it's doing what I say it's doing. So I hope that wasn't too terribly confusing. I hope you learned a little bit about docking. Uh, I'm still learning about docking, but I'm using it every day with all of my new creations. And I like it. The Boolean tool and the Boolean assistant is my favorite tool of all. But this docking, I'm really starting to fall in love with it. So... Thank you for watching. Be sure to check out our new channel, Laser Makers Realm, if you haven't done so. Thank you to my patrons. Uh, if you would like to support me and support the channel, you can find me at patreon.com slash hobo with wood. All your support from that goes to continuing to develop this channel, uh, helping me create projects. And those projects that I design and create uh, are then put on Laser Maker's Realm and given to you for free.
for free. You don't have to pay for anything. But the one thing that I do for my patrons is they get a little extra something that's not given away for free on Laser Makers Realm. So thank you, patrons, for your support. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for my subscribers. And we'll see you in the next video. Until then, I'm Hobo with Wood, and I'm out.